Hey folks, how you doing? Stephen Kim Boris here on the Wesleyan West Cambo Trail. And this is going to be episode three of the Blue Catfish Truth series. If you haven't seen episodes one and two, I suggest you go back and watch those first. We talked about some of the demonstrated invasive impact from the blue and flathead catfish here in the Delmarva area, especially, but up and down the Atlantic coast. This episode two of this series, we covered the 2017 Invasive Catfish Symposium and a lot of its findings. So if you haven't seen that, go check that out first. In today's episode, we get into more of the impact and more of the studies that have been done to determine if there's an impact on a lot of other species. Atlantic sturgeon, American eel, and perhaps the most controversial one here in the Maryland area, the blue crab. So I won't belabor the point anymore. Let's get straight to the interview with Mr. Aaron Bunch of the Virginia Department of Game and Inland Fisheries. So we touched on white catfish, touched on channel catfish. A lot of the, or one of the other controversial topics in terms of what is the impact from these catfish, shad and herring. Yeah, and that's very important. I mean, you think about the, the value, the in inherent, but also the economic value of, of American shad, hickory shad, alewife, and blueback herring mm -hmm. historically in Virginia is, is amazing. These fish used to... Um, basically turn the water silver as they came up these rivers and creeks to spawn in the spring. It would have been wild and, to see. And, and we don't see that anymore, um, largely due to, well, initially some overfishing practices uh -huh. and a lot of those uh, overarching impacts that we talked about before. I won't reiterate those, but... Um, and then when you add in non-native fish to the mix, an invasive species to the mix, such as flathead catfish and blue catfish, um, it raises concerns, right? Oh, yeah. And so uh, we at DGIF funded a large-scale uh, trophic dynamic study. What I mean by trophic dynamics is we were trying to figure out what these fish would feed on mostly, right? Yep. We were also looking at their population dynamics and what is driving the population to see if um, there were some environmental variables, uh, variables that are really driving these populations. And one of the main objective, objectives of that study was to look directly at what you asked. It was shad and herring. And so what we found, uh, and this is published, I'm co-author on a paper from Virginia Tech, we found that blue catfish and flathead catfish would feed on shad and herring, but it's generally in the spring. Mm -hmm. Makes sense with the it, runs. It yep. makes sense with the anadromous runs, diadromous runs up the river in the spring. Mm -hmm. Okay, so a lot of these fish will utilize these upstream freshwater reaches in the springtime. They'll they'll come from offshore areas and make their way as fast as they can based on environmental variables that are conducive to their breeding. And, and that's what they do to reproduce. Well, what we found was if there's an impediment or a dam oh, yeah. or something blocking, it's similar to uh, those fish kind of, it's like fish in a barrel, yep. so to speak, where the, the shad and the herring don't have, you know, uh, uh, they're not able to spread out. They're not, it's just more of a buffet, if you will. These shad and herring, most of the predation occurs when there's an impediment or a dam. Okay. And so you'll see high predation rates the further upstream you go, which makes sense. Yep. And so, um, but what we also found was on a per capita basis, flatheads are very selective towards fish. Um, a flathead is a fish eating fish, mm -hmm. right? Which is called a piscivore. Yep. And it's a highly piscivorous species and that's that's what they eat. So most of the impacts on shad and herring on a individual basis is going to be from a flathead. We did see some predation from blue catfish and there are there are more blue catfish out there. Oh yes. So it's kind of weighing those two things, but the further up in the watershed uh, the more predation we saw. Now, this is going to be a complicated question. I know that before I ask it, so, oh, yeah. so I apologize in advance. Do you, is there any kind of general ratio that you could 
say between what is the population ratio between blue cats and flatheads, or is it just too variable across different rivers? Okay, it from what we know about the flathead distribution, uh -huh. and this is another published paper that I'll share with you so you can post. Thank you much. Um, uh, from the Virginia Tech study, we looked at distribution of flathead catfish as well. And so they are mostly in the Hope, on the James River, uh -huh. they're in that Benjamin Harrison Bridge, Hopewell, and up, all the way up to Lynchburg. Okay. Okay. So, but a lot of the flatheads that we see that would have impacts to tidal river fisheries are going to be in that fall line area near Richmond. Okay. Okay. There is a population that was likely illegally stocked um, in the Pamunkey River. If you're watching this and you're thinking about stocking some wild fish that you catch, just please don't do that. That that really um, it makes it really hard to manage fisheries under those circumstances so if you're watching please don't stock fish it's, it's not a good thing it's a, it's a great point because you just don't know what effect it's going to have that's right yep. case in point the first record of uh, flatheads on the Rappahannock River was just Tuesday so two days ago uh, we collected the first two flathead catfish around 12 to 14 inches long and they'll likely establish in here and, and be another uh, you know, impact on these depleted fish populations. We're talking about American shad and river herring that are under moratorium status. Yep. And we're really trying to improve habitat and and make it easy for those populations to increase. And there are just some things that, that may impede that. And, you know, flatheads and um, blue cats may have a piece of that pie that I talked about. Exactly. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rattle off three more species here that impact was at least hypothesized on behalf of blue cats and flatheads. Sure. Oh, yeah. American eel, Atlantic sturgeon, and the last one will probably de dedicate its own thing to, because it's going to be a controversial one especially, oh, yeah. blue crab. Blue crab. So American eel, sturgeon, blue crab. American eel are some of the most widely distributed fish that we have in Virginia. You see them all the way up in the highest mountain streams where nothing else lives. Hmm. You'll see these large female adult eels that stay up there. And then you'll see them distributed throughout these rivers and lakes that we have in Virginia. And they are, have this awesome reproductive um, uh, strategy where they're actually the opposite of striped bass and Atlantic sturgeon and shad and herring. Out. They go out to sea to spawn yeah and inland to live. And so striped bass and these other anadromous fish go up river to spawn in freshwater and go out into the ocean to live most of their adult lives. Um, and so, you know, we're starting to see declines in American eel across the Atlantic coast. Hmm. And so that's a, that's a concern. Um, and a lot of you anglers out there you probably know how good uh, American eel is for bait. Oh yeah. So you know oh, yeah. that you know that they'll that they'll chomp down on some American eels. That they will. Okay. So um, Atlantic sturgeon. So of the thousands of stomachs that we collected, that Virginia Tech collected, um, we found zero Atlantic sturgeon. That's really good news. Yes, exactly. Um, uh, Game and inland fisheries. We kind of dug in a little bit more on the spawning grounds on the Pamunkey River and did some really in-depth DNA analysis. And we found a couple of blue catfish out of 130 that had sturgeon DNA in their stomachs. So we're looking at, I think it was like a one and a half percent of the blue catfish had actually had sturgeon DNA in their stomachs during the prime spawning period of Atlantic sturgeon in the Pamunkey River. And so the good news is we're not seeing 50 and 80 percent of blue catfish having Atlantic sturgeon in their stomachs. Yep. That's a good thing, right? So there's also the thought process of thinking about the overall population of blue catfish. Uh -huh. 
in that stretch of rope. When looking at DNA analysis, could that be a product both from the consumption of sturgeon roe in the same way it could be consumption of sturgeon itself? Absolutely, yeah. Okay. And so um, that's what we hypothesized that was in the fish diet at the time. Okay. It was an egg or a larvae rather yep. than... Because sturgeon have a really bony oh, yeah. structure. Yep. So even at a juvenile that big, they pretty much look the same as they would as adults. Mm -hmm. You can see their scutes, which is the really cool uh, hard structures along their back. Um, and so we'd easily be able to see those in the in the stomach of the blue catfish. There you um, go. But I guess that, the answer to your question is, at this point with the data that we have, the best available science, um, Atlantic sturgeon don't seem to be a... a, a, a large component of blue catfish diets in Virginia. Good to hear. Um, uh, I guess, was there another species or are we going to go back? <laughs> get, are we going to jump into blue crabs? So I, I guess at this point we'll jump into it because uh, uh, I'm not a Virginia native, I'm a Maryland native, and I, I love my blue crabs. Yeah. I, I, I love steamed crabs. So I want to make a point before I ask you the question. When you're getting into what's the impact on blue crab populations. Again, this gets back to what Aaron was saying before about considering all these other factors. What is the status of water quality in the bay? What is the status of submerged aquatic vegetation in the bay? What role does that play for blue crab populations? What's the harvest been on the behalf of humans? So before I asked, before I just give you that question to you, I just want to make that point again. You have to consider a lot of factors in terms of determining what's driving the population dynamics with blue crab. But with that being said, there are some valid points to discuss here. So Aaron, what do we think is the impact of blue crab, or excuse me, of, of the blue catfish on blue crab? Steve, you brought up a, a pretty complex issue in Chesapeake Bay. I, I, um, I do that from time to time. Yeah, yeah and it, <laughs> it, there's, there's not really easy answers. I keep coming back to this pie, right? Yep. And it's ultimately, What's the impact of blue catfish, the overarching set of impacts yep. to the blue crab population, right? Yep. What we found, uh, what Virginia Tech found, was that blue crab predation increased the further downstream you went. Mm -hmm. Kind of on that saltwater, freshwater interface. Makes sense. Right? Yep. So... Wherever the two species overlapped is where we would find the most predation. Also, we found the most predation in the fall season. So there was a higher probability of blue crab predation in the fall. And so where, those, where the two species overlap, both in time and over space, mm -hmm. is where you're going to have the most impact. Okay. Anglers out there... We do have to understand that um, there's a lot of different management scenario scenarios out there, um, and we, you know, overall we don't want to impact a a very important uh, uh, fishery for for the Chesapeake Bay. Exactly, because we have on the one hand, I'm a fisherman. Like if you're going to tell me that you can put me on 40, 50, 60, and above pound blue catfish, sign me up. Yep. You know, and I'm the same way. Who, who doesn't want to go catch a 50, 60 pound blue catfish in in large numbers? That's how you get people hooked on fishing. And, and that's where we talked about that balance before when we get into these management practices is like, I love catching big blue catfish. I also love eating blue crab. Exactly. So the bottom line is we have to work together, take a hard look at that scientific data and then find those management practices. Yeah. It, it's just something we have to work together, not against each other on. That's right. And I think, and we'll talk about it later, there's a compromise, and it's something that we really need to, to harp on. To be fair, when I overlap with blue crabs, I eat them too. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, folks, that wraps up episode three of the Blue Catfish Truth Series. And to rehash a few of those points, if you're looking to find those high percentage areas for catfish. If you can find a dam in the base of it, great place to target them. And I think that in the future, we're really gonna have to 
do more studies to determine what the impact on blue crab actually is. And again, it's a real struggle whenever you're trying to determine the base of impact because there's so much going on in the environment. Stay tuned for episode four, which is gonna be where we actually get into what the Virginia Department of Game and Inland Fisheries recommends as a management practice for blue catfish and flathead catfish. And that's where we get into what hopefully will be that compromise point that we're trying to find between blue catfish and flathead being a fun, exhilarating, great fish to catch and also trying to minimize their impact on native species. But for right now, let's get to some catfishing action and some more photos that I've received from you all out there from those of you who love chasing blue catfish, flathead catfish, and catfish in general. Any questions or comments, folks, let me know. Y'all have a good one. Oh. I think that's a fish. Yeah, it's a fish. That's a fish. Hell yeah. All right. No skunk today. <laughs> Feels decent. Oh, it's a giant, dude. Hold Oh, damn it. <laughs> Look at that.